this, the Palatoy Death Star. I'm gonna go over this vintage toy in depth, its history, and why I think this playset is important in the halls of all toy history. Plus, I go over how to put this toy together and care for it, so let's go. Welcome back to the channel, and on the previous episode, I took you through a history of who Palatoy was and how they came to have the Star Wars license to produce the Star Wars toys in the UK and Europe. And this brings us to this toy and why the Death Star by Palatoy was made so much different than the US Kenner made Death Star space station. The year is 1978, and Palatoy bring you Star Wars. There were a lot of toys made by Kenner in the US that looked completely different than how you see them made by Palatoy in the UK. Playsets like the Creature Cantina, Land of the Jawas, the Droid Factory, and the most famous of them all, the Death Star playset. Well, why was this? At a toy convention in 2019, ex-Palatoy employee Bob Brinken said that one of the reasons why the Palatoy and Kenner Star Wars toys were so different was that Palatoy toy factories couldn't get the Kenner toy molds and toolkits in time, and that the costs were too high to make original toolkits and update manufacturing processes to mass produce those toys in the UK and Europe. So other methods had to be used with the tools and materials available by Palatoy factories at the time. So that's why in the case of the Creature Cantina and the Droid Factory, they used the cost-effective method of vacuum forming to make the plastic bases. And then they supplemented injection molding with smaller parts like stands and doorways. And since the Millennium Falcon was so expensive to produce, it wasn't made in the UK until 1980 for the Palatoy Empire Strikes Back line of toys. Also, as in the case of the X-Wing, in the US it came with electronics, like the laser cannon, where you can pop in batteries and by pressing a button located at the rear fuselage, a red light would come on at the nose of the ship and a buzzing sound would be heard. To make production cheaper and price points affordable, in the Palatoy version, that was removed. But the Palatoy Death Star playset took a completely different approach, completely. The story is similar here to the story of why the Droid Factory and X-Wing is so different. The production costs would ultimately affect the retail costs. And sales folks over at Palatoy had to reassure retail stores that this was gonna be a hit since Star Wars was an untested toy from a movie. And toy store retailers had no idea if these Star Wars toys were gonna be popular and sell at all. So prices for the wholesale of these toys had to be reasonable for stores to commit to pre-orders and stocking their shelves. This meant that cutting the production costs would make sure the price was right for UK retailers. And the heavy cost of injection molding ultimately meant that they would also have to mark up toys to an unrealistic retail price. But there was also another reason. The box had to be able to fit the small toy shelves that were allowed by some toy stores in the UK and European markets. The US box was gargantuan, and when the time came to fulfill the markets in Europe and the UK, the Death Star space station was rejected due to shipping and distribution costs and the large shelf space it would take. So Palatoy designers submitted designs to 20th Century Fox, Lucasfilm, and Kenner that took the concept of a round Death Star playset with two stories of play separated by four quadrants of 10 rooms for play areas. The biggest change is that this playset was made mostly of heavy cardboard. And here is the package that I just got. I ordered this playset from Rogue 5 Toys on the internet, a seller that I completely trust. I've even met these guys at toy conventions. And when you buy fragile items like this, it really matters who you do business with. And the reason why I like sellers like Rogue 5 Toys is that they just don't give fair prices on items and know what market prices should be. They also base the price off what condition the item currently is in. Plus, they are collectors themselves and packaging is just as important to them. To make sure the item gets delivered safe and in the same condition as you saw the item pictured in. So when you buy an item like this and you don't know the seller, be afraid. Be very afraid. I'm kidding. Go on collecting forums online or in Facebook groups and ask other collectors if they have done business with them and their experience with that. You may be able to afford not doing that for less expensive items, but for more fragile, rare, and expensive items, 
don't chance this. I have to admit, these videos are the most I have researched for an episode yet, and to make videos like these possible, there are links in my description that support my channel, like visiting my website to find my merch shop, as well as collecting supplies to keep your collection safe and displayed perfectly. Even by liking this video and subscribing for more videos like this, it supports this channel. I also want to thank my supporters on Patreon, as well as my members right here on YouTube. Without your support, videos like these would not be possible. The links are down in my description for you to join my awesome communities and make these videos possible through your generous support. And now, let's go over what came inside the box, starting with the box itself. Released in 1979 by Palatoy, this retailed in the UK for average prices of nine pounds back then, and in today's money, that's $42.40, so not a cheap price for a child's toy. The outside box depicts a boy in a red turtleneck sweater playing with the toy on one side, and on the opposite side, a quadrant of photos showing the different play features of this set. And on the side of the packaging, we see the first 12 available action figures from Wave 1. Note that they included the vinyl cape Jawa, showing that this indeed was an early production photo to be put in circulation in the life of the Star Wars toys. As by 1979, only Toll Toys in Australia was making the vinyl cape Jawas at the time and into the 1980s. There were never cardboard inserts issued with this set. Instead, the original box would have come with two plastic baggies, one for containing the plastic parts and one containing the cardboard pieces. Inside the bag with the plastic items came six clear action figure stands, two laser cannons similar to what the X-Wing used, 12 clips, even though only 10 clips are needed, two are just extras, one black plastic turret base, two trash chute pieces, and one yellow-orange see-through plastic turret shield cover. In the baggie with the cardboard came these pieces, and there should be nine cardboard pieces. One wall section labeled A, one wall section labeled B, the trash compactor wall labeled C, the tunnel section labeled D, a small floor section labeled E, the cell block floor section labeled F, a floor and wall section labeled G, a circular card ring which does not have a label in the instructions, and the circular base which also doesn't have a label in the instructions. This cardboard feels like heavy, thick puzzle pieces that preschoolers would play with, almost like thin particle board. The instruction manual was one sheet with two printed sides, and even though the front box calls this playset simply the Death Star, on the instruction sheet it names it Death Star Play Center. And some boxes included the now ultra rare Palatoy Mini Catalog. Following the instructions is key to putting the cardboard structure in place. And in doing my research, no digital versions of the instruction manuals exist, at least none that I found. So I'm gonna do you a solid and let's go step by step on how to put this thing together. Take the wall labeled A and fold it 90 degrees. Then place the clips at the lower ends to stabilize it. Then take the trash compactor moving wall and fold it to form the floor. And then slide the tab into the left hand slot of section A. Slightly bend the ends of the tabs to hold it secure. Make sure not to force any of these tabs through the slots so you don't fray the edges. It's an almost 50 year old toy and super delicate. Next, get the wall section labeled B. Fold this to 90 degrees and place the clips on it to stabilize. Take section A and gently securing the trash compactor section, slide section A into the slots of section B. Next, get the tunnel section labeled D and fold into a hexagon shape, keeping the open side to the top. Fit this into the hexagon shaped opening on section A, first by sliding in one end, pressing the back into position in the central column, then sliding it across to the other end. I would be lying if I said this wasn't nerve wracking. Take the small floor section labeled E, it's the one with no square cutouts, and fit that into position. Open the circular base and place it on a large flat surface with the Star Wars illustration logo facing down and the mirror side facing up. Now gently glide the assembled wall sections matching the floor and walls to the holes in the base. Just use the trash compactor floor as a guide to where the walls should line up. Next, fit the clips into the base holes and make sure they're secure. 
Sometimes you get these vintage items dirty and grimy. I use fragrance-free and alcohol-free baby wipes to clean these items and then let them air dry before I assemble them. You can get this item and more supplies at my website, thepadawancollector.com. The link is in the description. Assemble the two halves of the trash chute and fit that into the square cutout in the floor section. Fit the floor section, locating the trash chute into the hole in the wall of the cell block. Take the combined floor and wall section, labeled G, and fold the floor to a horizontal position and fit its clips into the bottom of the wall section. Fit it in the remaining hole in the base of the playset. Lock the tab into the top of the central column, then fit the floor tabs into the wall slots. Then take the circular card ring and fit this into the central column. Everybody got that? Next, get the black turret base and then two laser cannons fit into the divoted areas on the side. You can place an action figure laying down. Then over this, place the yellow-orange see-through plastic cover. Then place the entire turret on top of the central column. You can make the laser cannon move up and down. The turret can rotate 360 degrees. Inside the tractor beam column, there should be a mirror sticker that's been placed to give the illusion of depth in the shaft. That's what she said. <laughs> The first room is the interrogation room, where you can recreate the scene where Princess Leia gets mind probed by Darth Vader. On the other side of the tunnel is a guard room with stormtroopers printed by each door, and other printed deco that shows readouts and other information screens. The next room has a physical wall ladder, and other designs on the walls to make the room appear as a functional room that a person working on the Death Star would use. There's a door that leads to the tractor beam, and a printout of the Death Star hologram, and also a physical black trash compactor chute, where our heroes can escape the pursuing troopers. The trash compactor area is designed with one moving wall to recreate the scene from the movie. And on the floor art of the trash compactor area, you can see debris as well as the Dianoga trash monster that tried to eat Luke, but sadly, this does not come with the Dianoga trash monster action figure. When the wall is fully compressed, it reveals the trash compactor service area. The trash compactor door swings up to allow our heroes to escape getting crushed, and this leads to the main Death Star room. Printed on the walls are stormtroopers, who are being called to the scene, a door leading to the docking bay, the wall ladder which continues from the room above, printed panels and pipes, and a door which leads to the Death Star control room. In the control room, there are printed drawn images of Death Squad commanders at work, and on the displays, the Battle of Yavin being depicted, with the Death Star HUD layout showing the position of the attack. The docking bay has art on the floor of stormtroopers in the elevator shaft, wall art of the troopers coming into the scene, and an area where Vader and Ben Kenobi had their last duel together. The space is big enough to dock a small ship there. The bottom of the playset shows a picture of all 12 of the first wave Star Wars action figures with the Palatoy logo, and a large Star Wars logo with an X-Wing in pursuit of a TIE fighter. The Palatoy Death Star playset was also available in this design in Canada, Australia and New Zealand in the Tool Toys factory brand and in France under the Meccano factory brand. Only in Canada did they get both Kenner and Palatoy design versions. Those lucky Canadians. So what do I think is better, the Kenner version or the Palatoy version? And I'm going to answer that on a future episode when I'm going to be forced to rank all the playsets from not so best to the best. And that is going to be hard to rank all of these playsets. But really, if you're going to compare these side by side, there is no comparison and both are classics. And if you want to see my review on the Kenner version, there's a link down in my description. But for the Palatoy version, this is a better depiction of how the Death Star actually was laid out. And it's in a circular layout so kids can have a better spatial play area where they can really recreate the scenes on the Death Star. And when it's not in use, this does make a fantastic diorama for displaying your toys. And the fact that this is a very large playset it becomes a centerpiece of your collection. I think this playset deserves to be celebrated as one of the best designed toys in the Star Wars line and one of the most iconic toys of all time. There is just too much of a story and history behind it not to have this. So let's mark this toy off our list, the Palatoy Death Star, 
that we got from Rogue 5 Toys for $1,750 with the acrylic case included. And you can get my collecting sheet for your use at thepadawancollector.com. But we are nowhere near done with our Palatoy story yet. Heck no. So join me on the next episode where I'm going to go over the awesome advertising that Palatoy did and how it was so creative and better than what we got here in the US. So to see that video, click right here on your screen. And as always, my friends, thank you, and I will see you next time. If you're new to the channel, check out the welcome video, or just check out the next episode. And please subscribe if you want to follow the journey. And remember, there is no shame in being a Padawan.